This evening we turn again to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll be focusing on verses 8 through 10. This is the word of the living God. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Let's ask God's blessing. Father, as we approach your word tonight, we do so with reverence and awe. You are a holy God, and your word is holy. We come asking for your spirit to guide our thought and to bless the words of my mouth that your people might be drawn near to you. Lord, keep us in your truth, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight we enter into a part of 1 Corinthians 13, which is quite different from what we have been covering thus far. The previous verses that we've already examined have teased out in great detail the nature of Christian love. That has been edifying, that has been challenging. But now Paul turns a corner in his argument to compare and contrast Christian love to certain other spiritual gifts. Suffice it to say that you probably won't hear too many wedding sermons that zero in on verses 8 through 12. And yet, in a way, these verses are more in keeping with Paul's larger argument that he began making in chapter 12 and that he will continue making in chapter 14. This whole section of the epistle is about spiritual gifts and especially about tongues, prophecy, and knowledge. As we wade tonight into verses 8 through 10, I want to give you up front an honest disclaimer about what you're about to hear. I do not hold the majority interpretation of this passage. Many, perhaps most commentators and scholars would probably disagree with my conclusions, and I am painfully aware of that fact. It's not as if I stand utterly alone, however. There are some scholars who have advocated the position I'm going to explain to you in a moment, and yet it is admittedly a minority position. I don't do this lightly. Disagreeing with faithful scholars should always give a preacher pause. But with all due respect... My conscience is not bound to necessarily agree with the majority because they are the majority. And I believe that the majority position has some serious problems with it, both exegetically and theologically. So I humbly beg to differ. Now, I would expect that you have probably heard other preachers present the, the majority position on this passage. You may believe the majority position and be convinced in your own mind that it is correct. So I don't ask you necessarily to agree with me, but simply to hear me out and not dismiss what I have to say. Just give it a fair hearing and then make up your own mind. I think that is a modest request. So we want to consider verses 8 through 10 by looking first at the Corinthian context, really dealing with the question, what problem is Paul addressing? Then we're going to take a careful walk through the text 
trying to figure out what is Paul saying. And then I will give you a proposed interpretation answering the question, what does Paul mean? Throughout this book, we have seen one glaring problem over and over again. What is that problem? A lack of love. The Corinthians didn't love each other as they should have. And that lack of love manifested itself in many different ways. Some of them are passive, some are more active. So let's briefly go back through the previous context by way of reminder. Back in the first chapter, Paul had exposed a serious problem in the fellowship at Corinth. They had quarrels in their midst. Specifically, they entertained party spirits with various camps developing. There was the Paul party, and then there were the supporters of Apollos. There were others who claimed allegiance to Cephas, which is known as Peter. And then the super spiritual party, which claimed to be the Christ party. And so they had broken out into these factions, and each camp guarded their turf and their territory very zealously. These competing allegiances were causing schisms to develop within the church. It was a problem that arose from a failure to love God first and to love one another as well. Paul returns to this problem in chapter 3, showing them that their divisions in their church arose from fleshly thinking, from jealousy and envy, from immature responses to other Christians. In chapter 4, the lack of love shows itself in attitudes of arrogance toward one another and toward the apostles. A passive form of this problem, this lack of love, appears in chapter 5 as they tolerate a man who is guilty of gross sexual immorality. And then in chapter 6, we found them going to court against one another, and that in front of unbelievers. That is surely a sign of a lack of love. These weaknesses and failures also show up within the context of marriage, as we saw in chapter 7. But the point gets much sharper in chapters 8 through 10. There is the issue of using Christian liberty to the detriment of your fellow Christian. They were claiming their rights as they covered over the harm they were doing to their fellow Christians. Perhaps one of the most egregious evidences of this lack of love is how they abused the Lord's Supper. Those who are wealthy and had lots of stuff came and gorged and got drunk while their fellow poorer congregation members sat by hungry and empty. And so they were despising the poor and needy brethren among them it was so serious that Paul says, some of you have been made sick and some of you have fallen asleep, meaning they died because of this lack of love. And now in chapter 12, we move into the discussion of spiritual gifts. It seems that they were actually misusing the good gifts given by the Holy Spirit for their own advancement even sometimes at the expense of their brethren. As we will see in chapter 14, this included speaking in tongues, which seemed to be viewed as the ultimate gift. Knowledge was also highly prized among the Corinthians, and they were using knowledge against one another. Now it's important to realize here that these gifts that are in view, the prophecy, the tongues, the knowledge, 
are revelatory gifts. They are gifts by which God conveyed revelation to the early church during that apostolic era. And this is an important transition time because the Old Testament, the Old Covenant era had come to a close. The New Testament scriptures were still in the process of being written and God used for that brief period, that foundational era, some of these gifts which conveyed revelation. Now to have a revelatory gift was indeed a great privilege. To abuse such a gift was a horrible sin. And to prefer a revelatory gift over the duty to love was short-sighted. So in a nutshell, here is the problem that Paul is confronting. The Corinthians failed to value Christian love. They preferred to show off their spiritual gifts to amaze and maybe even intimidate their friends. That was not loving. That was not wise. And so Paul is reasserting the primacy of love over all things, including spiritual gifts, especially revelatory gifts. So as he will wrap up this chapter, he is going to say, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. You see, here is the antidote to the problems that plague the Corinthian church. Love God and love one another. You might say, boy, pastor, that's awfully simple. And you'd be right. It is quite simple, isn't it? Many of our problems that come up in the church simply come from a lack of love for each other. And that lack of love for each other is often connected to a lack of love for God. Jesus himself said the two greatest commandments, the, the two commandments on which the whole law hangs, love God, love your neighbor. And Paul boils it down to just one word, Love is the fulfillment of the law. And this is why this chapter is vital for the health of the church, because there tends to be so little love between Christians. And if we can't love each other, if saints can't love saints, how on earth do we expect to love unbelievers and outsiders? And how on earth can we begin to hope to love our enemies and those who persecute us? We are called to lives of love, and that begins close to home, and it spreads to every relationship in every sphere of life. And Paul is calling down the Corinthians and saying, this church has a huge problem. It doesn't love like it should. Now, we don't want to lose sight of this. This is kind of the overarching theme. The problem is a lack of love. The solution is love God and love your neighbor. And now we come to the text itself. And I want to take a careful walk through verses 8 through 10. And we're trying here to answer the question, what is Paul saying? So we're trying to understand the content of his teaching here in these verses. Now I've already read to you the New American Standard Bible, which you know is my preferred translation. But now I want to read you my own translation from the Greek. We'll call it the New Pastor de Young Version. It's not very polished, it's not ready for publication, but here it is. And this is on your fill-in-the-blank sheet, if you have one. Love never fails, 
But if prophecy, they will be abolished, entirely useless. If tongues, they will cease, stop. If knowledge, it will be abolished, entirely useless. For in part we know, and in part we prophesy. But when the complete comes, the in part will be abolished, entirely useless. So let me walk through that phrase by phrase. The first statement is not at all controversial. Love never fails. Love never falls to the ground. Love never ceases or stops. It's never abolished. It's never out of season. And as we think about eternity, we are going to be with the Lord of love, and we are going to enter into the communion of love, and we are going to find heaven, the new heavens and the new earth, to be a land bathed in love. Perfect, sinless, holy love. Because God, the God who is love, is going to be with his people and expressing his love eternally, and it will never, ever cease. And so that's not at all controversial. No one disagrees with that. But next, in verse 8, Paul addresses three spiritual gifts. Prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. And as I said, all three of these are revelatory gifts. They are gifts through which God conveyed revelation to the early church in the first century. And I think almost all scholars would agree with this too. Nobody disputes that these are revelatory gifts. Well, Paul handles prophecy first perhaps because this is the gift that he will strongly commend in chapter 14. You might say this is his favored gift. He says prophecy will be abolished. It will be entirely useless. It will be made idle. Now, at the time of Paul's writing this book, the end of the cessation of prophecy was still in the future. But Paul could see the end coming. It would come to an end and be abolished. Next comes tongues. And tongues are specifically the spiritual gift of speaking in other languages. It's the gift of tongues. And they too will cease and stop. The end of tongues is in view. It's in the future for Paul at the moment that he's writing this passage. The third gift is knowledge. The spiritual gift of knowledge rather than just the ordinary experience of human knowledge. And this spiritual gift of knowledge will suffer the very same fate as prophecy. In fact, the very same word is used. It is abolished. It is made entirely useless. It is made idle. It ceases. Now, at the end of verse 8, we can conclude that Paul is pronouncing the cessation of these three revelatory gifts at some future point. They were operative then, but they will cease. They shall stop. They will be made entirely useless and unnecessary. Moving next into verse 9, we need to watch the word order. And most English translations tend to obscure this to make it more polished English. So for emphasis... Paul is putting one idea forward. He puts it at the beginning so that people will not miss it. And the idea that he puts forward is ak meros, in part. For in part we know, and in part we prophesy. That is a very literal wooden translation of the Greek. Greek. 
So these two gifts, knowledge and prophecy, and I think by implication, speaking in tongues also, provide only partial understanding, only partial revelation. They don't provide defective revelation. It's not wrong revelation. It's not imperfect. It's partial. It is ek meros, in part. It is a partial revelation. These gifts do not give and did not give full understanding because they could not reveal entirely. They were only equipped to give something partial. So in the present time that Paul was writing, these Corinthians had partial understanding due to these limited and restricted methods of revelation, specifically prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. So far, so good. The controversy arises from verse 10. And if you were listening carefully to my translation, you may have detected a different word that doesn't appear in your translation. Specifically, I chose the word complete rather than the term perfect. When the complete comes, as opposed to when the perfect comes. Now, a little background here might help. The Greek word here, teleos, means perfect, complete in all its parts, full grown, of full age, mature. So it has the idea of completion, it also has the idea of perfection. When that term is used in Greek philosophy, it typically means absolutely good with all virtues present and operating. It carries the idea of moral or ethical perfection without any blemish or imperfection. The Greek idea is really more of what we think of as perfect. We think like Greeks. Greek culture, Greek learning, Greek philosophy has impacted Western thought, and though we may not be aware of it, we are much more Greek in our thinking than we are Hebraic in our thinking. The Jewish or Hebrew concept, which is reflected in the Septuagint as well as in the New Testament, more often means complete, mature, fully developed. So the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says this. In the Pauline corpus, that's all of Paul's writings, in the Pauline corpus, whole seems to be the sense of teleos in 1 Corinthians 13.10. Now you say, well, Pastor, your translation is significantly different from my Bible. Are you taking liberties? No, because the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, a very well-respected resource, says the proper meaning here is whole, or if you will, completes. It is certainly a legitimate translation of the word, and it's the preferred translation according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. They go on to say, the gifts do not give the full knowledge which is to come. In the New Testament, teleos never seems to be a gradual advancement to Christian perfection. It plainly means whole or entire in Matthew, Paul, and the Catholic epistles. And it also has the sense of mature in some passages in Paul. So to render this term complete or whole is not way outside of the realm of good translation. In fact, they're saying that's the best way to understand it. And it really is quite a different concept to say 
when the complete comes as opposed to when the perfect comes. It really changes how you look at these verses. And for my part, I strongly prefer the idea of complete. So then what will happen when the complete comes? The text says the in part will be abolished. The partial will cease because now it is completely useless and entirely unnecessary. The complete has eclipsed the partial. And if you had your choice anyway, what would you rather have? A partial version or the whole story? A part of the information or the whole of the information? Well, of course we would prefer the whole, the complete. Tell me everything. Don't tell me just headlines. Tell me the whole story. And what Paul is saying here is that when the complete comes, the partial will be done away with. You won't have any need for it anymore. It'll be gone. It'll be eclipsed. So the key interpretive issue revolves around this idea of the complete. What is it, and when does it come? The text clearly indicates that when the complete, the teleos, comes, then those inferior methods of revelation will expire and be useless. The majority position says that the perfect or the complete is a perfect understanding that we will instantaneously experience when Jesus Christ returns at the end of human history, when he comes back to judge the living and the dead. And as best I can tell from my studies on this, the majority position bases this interpretation on the meaning of verse 12, which we haven't looked at yet. From verse 12, they conclude that only when we see Jesus physically face-to-face -face at the second coming, only then will we have perfect and complete knowledge. So the appearance of our Savior will bring us instantaneously perfect, full, complete knowledge. That's the majority position. Now, there is a variation of the majority position, which says, no, it's not at Christ's second coming. It's when we die and see him in heaven. And then in heaven, we will have the full and complete. That's where we will experience it. Well, here is my problem with the majority position, as it's stated, that it's going to be Christ coming at the end of history. And I think this is a problem which they don't seem to acknowledge. If the perfect is the return of Christ at the end of history, then I think this chapter inescapably teaches that prophecy, speaking in tongues, and the gift of spiritual knowledge is still operative today. And essentially, we lose the in-house argument with our charismatic friends. And we are forced to admit that continuing revelation will be in force until the end of human history. And therefore, our Reformed insistence that the Word of God contained in the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments is the only rule for faith and life, that is a wrong position, if this is true. Because you have to make room for continuing revelation. Why? Because it's going to continue until Christ returns. I don't see how you can rule out continuing revelation if you say 
that the complete is the return of Christ, and it's when Christ returns that the partial will be taken away. Tongues, prophecy, knowledge, it continues then until Christ returns, which means it continues right now. And we have been wrong for 500 years. And they have been correct for the last 100 years because that's how long they have been making this case. So what is the minority position? What do I myself think that Paul means here? It's my belief that the complete is not some experience of perfect knowledge derived from Christ's return to earth. But I believe the complete means the complete revelation of God found in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. In other words, the closing of the canon of scripture. For when scripture came, the need for tongues, prophecy, and special knowledge was over. Those partial modes of revelation were abolished and made ineffective by Scripture itself. The revelatory gifts have ceased. They ceased at the end of the apostolic era, at the end of the first century. Now, I told you that I'm not alone in holding this interpretation. Nor is this merely my privately held, personally concocted opinion. Dr. Simon Kistemacher, in his commentary, acknowledges this view in his commentary, although he himself doesn't seem to agree with it. Siampa and Rosner give it a fair treatment, although they too end up rejecting the interpretation. But let me read to you how they put it. I think their description is good. Some scholars have argued that the perfect, complete thing to which Paul was referring was the completion of the canon or the maturing of the church, one or the other of which they attribute to the disappearance of the more spectacular gifts from most, if not all, churches in the post-apostolic period. So that is simply to say, there are some other people who believe this. (laughs) And it's always, it's dangerous to take a minority position. It's super dangerous when you're a minority of one. (laughs) That is the best recipe for heresy and a good way to get bounced from the ministry. And I distrust anyone who comes and says, I have a bright new idea and I'm the first person to discover this. And nobody else has seen it, but I'm God's gift to the church to make it known. And I I avoid taking that stance. But you see, there have been scholars who have looked at this, who have weighed the exegetical evidence that I just laid out for you, and they have said, you know, he's talking about partial means of revelation and the contrast is with something that is complete and it is not a huge jump to say we're comparing partial revelation with complete revelation and we believe the scriptures are complete and for that matter perfect revelation we don't doubt that well according to this minority view As the apostolic era came to a close and the canon was complete and the books began circulating, as the church matured, they then had a complete revelation of God's will in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Moreover, in scripture, we see God in the face of Christ. And hence, the revelatory gifts that were given by the Spirit in the first century ceased to operate because they were frankly unneeded. The fullness of revelation had come. And therefore, we affirm, as our confession of faith states, that it pleased the Lord 
at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto the church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be most necessary, those former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. God used all kinds of different methods of revelation in the Old Testament, in the early church, but he knew it was necessary and important that his will be condensed and inscripturated in writing. And that was going to arm the church in its conflict against the world, the flesh, and the devil. It was going to serve for the propagating of the truth around the world and the preserving of truth in times of darkness. And so, the Holy Scriptures are given to us so that we may know the mind and will of God. And isn't that what Revelation is really all about? What is the mind and will of God? That's what we look for in Revelation. So I believe that the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are our only rule for faith and life not the ongoing revelations received through spiritual gifts. We have the Bible. We do not need prophecy, tongues, or special words of knowledge. Now you might say to yourself in the car on the way home, boy, that was a pretty dense academic sermon. Was there anything practically helpful? Here's the practical side of this. Read your Bible. <laughs> Read your Bible. Don't be waiting around for God to bring some tingly sensation upon you so that you receive immediate and direct revelation from heaven so you know how to live your life here on earth. Read your Bible. And as you read your Bible, go to your Bible with the prayer and the expectation, God is going to speak to me. Through this book, I am going to hear the voice of God. Through this book, I am going to see God face to face. He is going to make himself known to me. He is going to make his will known to me. I go to my Bible on the tiptoes of anticipation, yearning for the truth he will convey to me. Because if you take the alternate position, and if you work it out to its logical conclusions, and if tongues, and if prophecy, and if words of knowledge are all still operative today, you better get a pretty good-sized notebook and some pencils. Because every time some prophecy, some word of knowledge, some revelation comes through tongues to anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world, you better quick scribble it down. Because God is still pouring out his will for the church through these means of revelation. And you better just take good notes. But you see, our reform position says it's the Bible that is the key to our spiritual lives. It is through the Bible that God makes himself known to us. And if you will just open up your Bible and prayerfully and faithfully read it with the desire to know God, he will speak to you through the word. Sometimes when I'm kind of messing with candidates and trying to trip them up just a little, you know, in good Christian fun, I ask these candidates, is God still revealing himself today? And they know the right answer is no, no, under no circumstances. No, 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 no. And, and I agree with that. And, and essentially, I've just preached that. But, but I will say this. Does he reveal himself through the word today? 
Yes, he does. Is there any continuing revelation, not in terms of new information, but in terms of God dealing with us through this book? I mean, think back to what we have gleaned out of these verses on Christian love. Has God been dealing with your heart? Has he been exposing in you a tendency not to love like you should? You see, God speaks through his word. And when he speaks, it's powerful. It's transforming. He lays things bare. He uproots things that need to be uprooted. He plants things that need to grow up in our characters. He shows us Christ and his beauty and his glory. He pulls back the veil and he shows us who he is as God. And that's how you should read your Bible. So when you get up tomorrow morning and say, well, it's that time of the day again. I've got my coffee here to keep me awake. Don't look at your Bible and say, well, pastor's always hounding me to read my Bible and I'll do my duty. So if he asks me, I'll be able to say, yeah, I've read my Bible. No, open it up and say, Lord, I'm here to meet with you. Speak to me through your word. Show me yourself in this book. Deal with my heart. Deal with me. Transform me through this. And I think if this is faithfully done, prayerfully done by Christians, the effect is powerful. It may not be as splashy and as fantastic as what you might see on Christian television. But it is so much more wholesome. And it is so much more real. Because God is dealing with you through his word. And so this is a very practical thing. It raises the question, where am I going to get my revelation? Where am I going to seek God? In these ecstatic experiences or through that ordinary, humble means of his word. And through a due use of these ordinary means, you will grow in grace towards maturity in Christ. You will grow up as a Christian and be strong and steadfast. I sometimes wonder, as people say, you know, I just am not growing in my Christian life. Are you reading your Bible? <laughs> and that's a simple question, but it's a good question. Are you reading your Bible? Because if you leave your Bible closed on its shelf to collect dust, your spiritual life is going to just hover for a while, and then it's going to start to tank. And the further you get away from a regular habit of Bible reading, the more isolated and alone you're going to feel. You will sense a great gulf in your life between you and your God. Why? Because you're not taking up his word to read it and to meditate on it as you should. So if you take nothing else from this sermon tonight, if most of what I've said has been like gibberish to you, if you maybe wonder if I've been speaking in tongues, read your Bibles. Seek God in his word, and he will meet with you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us through this written page. And even tonight, Lord, you are dealing with our hearts we pray that you would help us to value and honor your word and to obey what it teaches, especially as regards love for you and love for our neighbor. Hear us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.